Hi, welcome again for another sit down. So today we are going to do some analysis on each country that we passed through on our road trip from Nairobi all the way to Cape Town. Remember we passed through nine countries and the nine countries includes Kenya. So we shall be comparing our country Kenya and the experiences we've had in East Africa to these other countries that we had visited for the first time. So you guys just sit back and enjoy. You are going to be shocked. It's a culture shock video. If you're watching us for the first time, I'm Liv Kenya and this is Hadia. So we are travel buddies. We're usually the three of us, including the guy behind the camera. He's called Patrick. And we usually invite you guys to travel with us. We do a lot of road trips. And this year is not any different. We've already done our first road trip. It's called Mount, Mount Kenya Circuit. Now the next trip will be Kilimanjaro Circuit. And you guys are invited. If you'll be watching this video much, much later, just know we always have so many trips coming and we invite you guys and we do... Right now we're doing uh, self-catering, self-drive kind of trips, but in future we hope to do like a uh, full board kind of trips. So stay tuned, you'll get a lot of pointers for when you'll be traveling to these eight countries. Tanzania is our brother country. It's basically one of the East African countries, and we have a lot of similarities. Just, uh, we've, I think we've done some culture shock on, the, on Tanzania, the first time we went to Tanzania, and we told you guys a lot of culture shocks. If you've never watched any of that, we'll repeat some of them here, but you can go back and check on our other trips, like the road trip to, Zam to Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. Zanzibar, yes. Rwanda. Zanzibar. Uh, on a road trip to Rwanda, from Kenya to Rwanda, to Rwanda a road trip from uh, around Lake Victoria. We've, we've been to Tanzania a couple of times. So if you're telling you anything, trust me, we are telling it, we are saying it with a lot of confidence because we've been there several times. Our first culture shock in Tanzania, Tanzanians are very trusting. I don't know if it's because of their culture or they still follow the African traditional culture or it's maybe religion, we are not very sure, but they are very trusting. You remember there was a place somewhere mm -hmm. next to, what was the name of the reservoir? Mtera Reservoir. Mtera reservoir. Mm -hmm. There's another lady, she was selling fish, she was selling to us some fish, some fried fish. Oh my, I've been, now that I've mentioned that, I'm even salivating. Mm -hmm. She was selling some fish to us and we had asked, we had asked her to get her, to get her, get her some chili sauce. There's just some very delicious chili sauce. It has some, I think, tamarind, mm -hmm. chili, and some other very nice ingredients. Imagine she just gave us the entire basket of fish to hold as she goes looking for the chili. You know, it, let me just tell you, in Kenya, if you try that... Unless it's the coastal. Yes, yes. If, it's yeah, okay, it's, that, that, that culture is also the same to the coastal Kenya. Yes. They're also that trusting because mm -hmm. of the culture. But in, in Nairobi, if you try that, you just leave the entire basket of fish or whatever of your merchandise to anyone mm -hmm. that you're going to look for change or you're going to look for what? Something else. Mm -hmm. When you return, you won't find that car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about Nairobi only. I believe many cities, it's like that. So as the Tanzanian side, people are quite trusting. And because of that trust, I don't think you can even steal from them. I think you just feel guilty because they, they are just generally very nice people. Yeah. Tanzanians generally love visitors and for that matter, they love Kenyans. If you just tell them you're a Kenyan, they're like, oh, you are our brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, they treat you like, a, they actually treat you as a brother. Not like, they're not like pretending they just treat you as a brother because they consider Kenyans as brothers and we take that. You're our brothers. Second culture shock that we experience in Tanzania regards to gender. And, and booking rooms. Mm -hmm. No two people of the same gender will be allowed to share a room. So if you're traveling with your sibling, your relative, your mother, your parent, and you're of the same gender, you'll not be allowed to share one room. You, we, this came as a shock to us because mm -hmm. here, we do not have those limitations. We just, we, mm. we, we count, it, for us it's head count. Yes. Not gender. No, not gender. <laughs> So that was shocking to us. We've struggled. We've said that in a couple of videos. Most times that increases your budget mm -hmm. because you will be required to book two separate rooms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So you need to consider that when you're booking your reservations in Tanzania. So when, when you travel to Tanzania, just know Tanzania is a land of plenty. In fact, Kenyans, Kenyans get a lot of food. We import a lot of food from Tanzania. It's, it, it feeds a great percentage of Kenyans. Now, having said that, the culture shock was, there are some foods that in Kenya we consider as main dish, but Tanzanians consider it as a side dish. For instance, when you ask for rice, maybe rice and beef, just be sure you will get beans, beans like what? Yes, you'll get beans and green vegetable on the side. Yet in Kenya, you, when you go to a hotel, you will order for rice and beans. Now when you're in Tanzania, you ask for rice and beans, people are looking at you like, where is the, which is the main, main, main meal? Mm. When are you going to ask for the meat? Where is the protein? Where is the protein? Yeah. <laughs> so whenever you ask for rice or you ask for ugali, just know it will come with some green vegetable and some beans. So I, with that, I think they, they do eat a lot of healthy, healthy meals. Yeah, they do. And the portions yes. are great. Yes, there's a lot That's of great. food. We always love traveling to Tanzania because food is never a problem. Mm -hmm. They cook the same way as Kenyans do, but their foods, food portions are, are good. And oh. we love food. The fourth culture shock relates to dress code. Mm -hmm. Generally, when you visit Tanzania, you'll notice that women dress modestly. You would rarely find people in tight clothes, short, revealing, revealing clothes. So whenever you visit, be mindful of their culture, be respectful. Mm -hmm. And if you're planning to wear something short, carry a scarf to just cover yourself. Actually, one time we almost got whipped in Bosisi for wearing short dresses. dresses. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget that day. Yes. Even, even the whole... You don't show your cleavage yeah, you don't show too your much. Cleavage, cover just, your just carry a scarf. To be safe, just carry a scarf. Yeah. Because you never know. If, there was a policeman who asked us that, who told us that we need to cover ourselves or else we'll be whipped. <laughs> and he was serious about that. So, to avoid getting whipped, dress modestly whenever you're visiting Tanzania. When you go to Rome, do what Romans do. Like we said, guys, Tanzania have good roads. However, they follow all the traffic rules. So when you're in Tanzania, just know when you're approaching a town, drive slowly until you get to 50 kilometers per hour. Be cautious because even though the roads are good, there's a, there's a lot of temptation to overspeed. But there are a lot of policemen along the road hidden. Some are hidden, some are not. But they, 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 are, they usually have the speed gun. And if by any chance you overspeed, even by one kilometer per hour, just know you'll pay hefty fine up to 3,000 Kenyan shillings. Yes, yes up to 3,000 Kenyan shillings. So just know that. It's actually up to, up to 1,500 Kenyan shillings. Yes. yes, up to 1,500 Kenyan shillings for every violation. So if you have the money, just overspeed. If you don't have the money, either drive at night or drive during the day and follow all the traffic rules. Now, there are, their roads are well serviced. That is why they have very good roads. Imagine when we were heading, when we were head left, uh, Dodoma, we were heading towards Tunduma border. We came across a long stretch of over 50 kilometers of uh, diversion because the road was under construction. But by the time we were returning, six weeks later, the road was almost complete. They just, there was just like maybe a stretch of three kilometers left of the diversion. That in, in Africa, by the way, that is very efficient. Now, I commend the contractors who are working on that road. I don't know if it is the entire Tanzania that the contractors are that efficient or it's just the contractors along that road, but we were just surprised. We were surprised and we were amazed that there are people who are, who are actually that efficient. And on that point, we took longer in Tanzania because of driving maintaining those speeds. We wanted yes. to drive during the day so that we can see those attractions. Everything, yes. We wanted to see everything, we wanted to show you people everything. That's why we were a bit slow. 50 km per hour. Yes. In if large, you're, if large you're not city. interested in seeing anything in Tanzania, just drive at night. But as long as you're driving during the day, you might take longer than the, than you would 
in maybe Kenya or any other mm-hmm. African country. So just like Kenya, Tanzania is generally a very beautiful country mm-hmm. that is diverse in so many ways. Even when they're ranking the top destinations in Africa, Kenya and Tanzania are always at par. They are always at par. Yeah. Tanzania is diverse. Coming to like, they have lowlands, they have highlands, very beautiful mountains. We're mm-hmm. talking about Kilimanjaro, Mount Hanang, Mount Meru. Mm-hmm. And they have countless lakes. And the view of the Great Rift Valley from Bear region is just too spectacular. Spectacular. Mm-hmm. We've said this so many times, you must visit Tanzania. Yes. It's that beautiful. Okay, mm-hmm. they, uh, we also observed that they also have very good roads. Let me just say, generally, Africa has stepped up in matters infrastructure and their roads are so good. Tanzania roads are so good. Remember in our previous video, we said that Tanzania is somewhere. We can rank it like maybe in the top five. Yes. yes. Now, uh, Tanzania roads are so good, but they are quite narrow. They have really good signage. But they are narrow. In fact, when you are heading towards Tunduma border, there are some places where we head to where you, you remember Tunduma border is a very busy border. So there are a lot of trucks that carry luggage from Dar es Salaam all the way to Zambia. There are plenty of them. So you realize because of the narrow roads and the escalations, like the roads are quite in, inclined, they are quite hilly. We were at some point required to the smaller cars were required to park next to the road like off the road and then they allow the trucks to pass for like even 40 minutes you'll be waiting for 40 minutes for trucks to just pass before you can you can also follow that is a safety it is i think it is a safety it's a safety measure but at the same time we still went and overtook those trucks (laughs) yes Mm -hmm. somehow you know, trucks climb, climb hills very slowly. And so, they're bound to. Yeah, the, the, somehow, if, if maybe the brake is, the brakes, the brakes are not so good. Mm-hmm. If they are faulty, they would uh, reverse backwards. But when we would, we went, after, even after they have been allowed to like pass forty minutes, we would just come and overtake them anyways. Now we were asking ourselves, what is the logic? Mm-hmm. I don't know, but I would recommend. If anyone in the Tanzanian government, the roads sector, is listening, I would recommend maybe they could consider including the climbing lane, just like in Kenya and many other countries we've been to, include the climbing lane so that the trucks can just continue uh, going slowly on the climbing lane while other cars overtake. That is what I would recommend. But otherwise, the roads are spectacular. So there are two other observations we made about Tanzania, actually three. The first one is, we, we've been, let me just say this before I mention my actual point. We've been to Dar es Salaam city when you are heading towards Zanzibar. And Dar es Salaam is a proper city with skyscrapers. It's quite, it's a big city and it's very clean. The infrastructure is just on point. Now, when we went to Dodoma, being the capital city of Tanzania, we expected to see something much bigger than Dar es Salaam. But when we got there, I tell you guys, we were surprised. Dodoma is quite small for a capital city. But you guys told us, the people who live in Tanzania, they told us that there are some plans underway to make, uh, to expand the the capital city, to make it bigger. In fact, there is the electric uh, SGR, electric standard gauge railway, that is underway. There is the Magufuli city. It's also somewhere on the outskirts of Dodoma. They also plan to, there are plans to make the international airport in Dodoma and many other structures that are still underway to make Dodoma a proper capital city. So initially, Dar es Salaam was the capital city mm-hmm. and then it was moved to Dodoma for administration purposes. That is what we were told. Mm-hmm. So they are still in the process of making it into a bigger city than what it actually is. But otherwise, we were just shocked. We didn't expect that the Dodoma was that small. That small, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then a second observation, my dear. Ah, wine and vineyards and grape farming. Mm-hmm. We actually have never seen any wine made from Tanzania. Mm-hmm. So when you go to the Dodoma and we saw that grape farming was actually big in the region, yeah. we were shocked. 
we were very much we were shocked. very shocked and they're actually very mm. very nice they, they sell the grapes very along cheaply. the road yeah along the road very cheaply ensure mm. you buy some when you're on that route so you might consider Tanzanians please tell us which which wine mm. do you guys make we just saw their grape vines the grape vineyards we ate some grapes we were told that you 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 make a lot of wine which kind of wine do you guys have lastly accommodation in tanzania is relatively cheaper mm -hmm. as compared to its neighboring countries and when you book accommodation expect to get heavy breakfast that's what makes accommodation in tanzania very interesting yeah you would notice in all our meals would be eating spaghetti and and maybe and sweet potato meat. and they produce they, they mm. give you a, there are a lot of fruits pineapples and mm. Watermelon. Watermelon. They call it tikiti maji. Mm -hmm. It's always in the breakfast. Heavy breakfast. You would actually skip lunch. Yes. Once you're in Tanzania, you eat their breakfast. You're, you you're don't need lunch. Go. Yeah, you're good to go. So it saves on the cost yes. for the kind of accommodation they offer. Very fairly priced. So Zambia is one of the biggest countries in Africa. And it stretches, it stretches all the way from... I think they are north to south. We we transverse literally across. Mm -hmm. So, the first thing we observe from the moment we cross the border is that Zambian men have short stature. If you agree with me, if you've ever been to, to Zambia and you agree with me, just please let me know in the comment section. Because we tried to observe throughout and we kept wondering, why are the Zambian men so short? You know, we... The African men are known to be quite tall. In in Kenya, Ke Kenyans, I wouldn't say they're the tallest people, there, but our Kenyan men are tall. Imagine we could see like most men were like between 5'3 to around 5'7 is the tallest. And we were like, how comes they are so short? I know it's, we call it Mombile or it's, what do you call it in, in, in English? Mombile is... Mm. It's just nature how they are they are built, mm -hmm. but creation. We were, yeah, but but we were surprised. Honestly, mm -hmm. we were surprised. Okay, the second observation comes. It's about women. Okay, I'm just smiling because this point is funny. It's about women and their bras. We've asked you, Zambian women, tell us your secrets. How come you don't? They don't like bras. They don't like bras. Bras are braziers in full. <laughs> We actually read a statistic and we said 7 out of 10 Zambian women never wear bras. bras. We were in Lusaka and we had stopped our cars. We were waiting for the other group to finish up with the police issue. Mm -hmm. And we, we took statistics. And we, imagine in a market, it's not just anywhere, in a market where you'll expect the most random people. Yes. We counted and we were like, ah, have we seen that? Just what we have seen. Is that even true? <laughs> I think we are missing something. Tell us, Zambian women. Okay, you guys told us in the comments that the African, traditional African woman used not to wear bras. We agree. Uh -huh. But let's face it, we are, not, we are no longer there. We observe some of the cultures, but we are no longer there. We've, you cannot go to work without bras. Unless, or it's just a Kenyan thing. No, it will be a bit distracting. I would imagine. Yes. So maybe it is for health purposes or maybe it's just part of the cultures. Others say that generally Zambian women do not have big breasts. So mm -hmm. mostly there is no need to wear the bras. But okay. you guys just tell us the secret. I think there's something you are still missing. Yes. Now let's talk about food. Zambian food is very similar to the East African food. We were so surprised. In fact, they cook just the same way my grandmother used to cook. When you're, when you're cooking either any kind of meat or chicken, you have to first roast it and then you can stew it. I felt like I was eating my grandmother's food. It was so delicious. Now, they serve their food in, in, they serve their food in buffet style, even in the local food stalls. We call them kibandaski in Kenya, kibandas. You'll have to go get your food like the buffet style. So you just go there, you get like a variety of food laid down there, and then you just choose, I want this, this, and this, and this, and then they serve you. However, when you get there and you're waiting for food, you're waiting to make your order. If you just stand there and you're waiting for someone to show you that this is the food or, or something, you'll be surprised. You'll wait there until tomorrow. 
nobody will ask you to order. If you won't talk, nobody will talk to you. Poor customer service, especially in food service. Oh, that was just horrible. They have poor customer service. When you go to a food store or a hotel, just ask the waiter which food is available. Just make the order there and then. Don't expect that you'll just sit down and they'll come to serve you. Forget about that. Now, something else uh, we realized also from the, this entire road trip that the African Africans have very similar foods, especially some of our main sources of carbohydrates are made from maize meal. So the, it, all that, the, the only difference is maybe the degree of refining the maize or the type of maize and all that. In Kenya, our maize, we make, uh, ours is ugali. Mm -hmm. In Kenya, it's ugali or sima. In Uganda, it's posho. It's posho. Even in Rwanda, in Rwanda, it's also posho. In Zambia, they call it nshima. nshima. Mm -hmm. Yes. In, in even Malawi, yeah, Malawi also call it nshima. nshima. In the southern part, Botswana, South Africa, South Africa Lesotho. Lesotho, and Namibia, they call it pap. Yes, yeah. so that is just the same same food. In the Western countries, it, West African countries, it's made using cassava mostly. Yes. It's called fufu. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's called fufu. Some also use maize, maize flour. So, yes, there's that similarity that we also we noted. Now, in matters food also, you remember in Tanzania we told you that they offer very heavy breakfast. Forget about that when you go to Zambia, unless you're going to Livingstone. You know Livingstone is a touristic uh, town, so they know one or two things about food and hospitality but these other places my friend you'll either be given two slices of bread and tea or nothing at all you might need to buy your own breakfast on the side after paying for accommodation so matters food guys kindly note that unless you had a similar experience just let us know another culture shock relates to ba to bad roads or would i say poor roads coming from a country like kenya that has very good roads I would say our highways are relatively good. Mm -hmm. And then transitioning to Zambia, you would get massive potholes. The road between Tunduma to yes. between Tunduma to Kampirimposhi, yeah. between Katimamulilo to Livingstone, mm -hmm. and then from Lusaka to Luangwa Park. Uwe. The roads are terrible. You'd get a very huge pothole that even your car can just get in and fit in there. Imagine, you won't even know how to... To circumvent the the pothole it was that bad so to us it was really shocking to we were even questioning ourselves how do drivers survive such roads mm -hmm. and if you're thinking like perhaps you could travel at night that can be a tricky situation if you're driving with foreign plates because the police there informed us that car, cars with foreign plates and cars on transit are not allowed to to drive past 10 p.m I don't know if that is true because we asked you guys and nobody gave us a comprehensive answer about that. Mm -hmm. But just if you are traveling around now, you just better be safe just drive during the daytime. And when the night comes, find accommodation in the nearest hotel, in the nearest town, I mean, to spend the night. And you can actually, uh, from 10, it's called mm -hmm. from 4 a.m., you can start traveling again. Mm -hmm. But remember traveling during the dark with all those potholes is also not very safe yes still on the roads we paid a lot of those those highways that you were seeing attract tolls we, we paid about up to around seven toll stations oh eight actually eight until we exited zambia we paid eight 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 tolls 20 kwacha per per station but in Tunuma, mm -hmm. we paid twenty dollars, and we paid twenty dollars again for the train, for the road toll. But you could not see any construction ongoing, which was a bit shocking because when you are paying such an amount, you'd expect that there were there were active developments going. Yeah, going in place. We felt robbed, yes. honestly. <laughs> <laughs> now remember, these long stretches, you would hardly get to a town. The towns are. What do you call it? Sparsely located. Yeah. And finding a restaurant or a filling station would be really difficult. In fact, no restaurant. You would actually 
if you are smart carry some snacks that you would eat along the way it will come it will go a long way trust me mm-hmm. because most uh, the only kind of food we could find along the road would see some ladies coming from the villages with a pot imagine they they want to sell you food in pots like the cooking pot they want to maybe pick some chicken or some mushroom or some boiled maize from their homes yes from their homes literally they packaged it in their cooking pots now you're supposed to pick that was a culture shock to and, us and they would stop near those massive potholes, potholes. they know you will slow down yes they know you'll slow down and so they will stand there food. they and stand there and start showing you if, if you want food and then you're like to buy. honestly i was shocked I didn't think that there are people who sell food with the cooking pots. Yeah, it was. <laughs> we are used to packaging even if it's just a polythene bag. I know in can- in Kenya we do not allow polythene bag, but those countries that allow polythene bags they usually put the food mm-hmm. even if it's cooked food in a polythene bag or in skewers. For them it was cooking pots. Now Open. when we came across some drivers and asked them how do you guys eat along this road and then they were like those are the only food you'll come across along the road, so you better just buy that one if you're hungry. So as much as we told you that night travel is technically prohibited or restricted, the good thing is they have plenty of labels. The first time we did not understand what label was, you know, they, have, they, they gave it a very funny name. In, in Zambia it was not called label, but as you go, you, as you go downwards towards Namibia, Botswana and South Africa. Now you, it will be very clear. It's Lebe. Lebe is somewhere just next to the road. It is like maybe an extension from the road where the trucks or any other drivers can just go and park their cars and sleep or rest or something. Usually you'd see maybe a, a stand or a big tree and some seat, sure. some stools or benches. So it is a place where you go and rest. I'm assuming that they constructed those lay bays in Zambia because of the n- night travel restrictions and also the long distances truck that drivers yes, need to rest. Yes, the truck drivers need to rest because there are long distances and very few towns along the road. Mm-hmm. So we were surprised we had never seen that. In Kenya, there are very few such places and mm-hmm. they even don't give them a name. You would see a sign, a road sign with a big tree drawn and stools below. Initially, we thought it was like the big fig trees somewhere there. Yes, but well, that's what a lay bay. It, it, the, it, the sign will keep changing to tell you how many kilometers to that lay bay. To the lay bay. Yes, so that we were surprised and we were actually impressed by that from Zambia. From Zambia to us, this, all those other South African countries, they have the lay bay. Zambia is a very nice place for farmers. The weather is very good. They, they, they receive a, a lot of rain throughout the year. Uh, they also have huge chunks of arable land. From what we could see when we were driving along the highway, we could see kilometer squares of arable land, guess what, underutilized. As a Kenyan, that is that was very painful to watch <laughs> because in Kenya we don't, we, we like almost, with a, almost more than a third or even a half of the country is arid and semi-arid areas. You cannot do farming unless you do a lot of irrigation. Now imagine that these people have plenty of, of rainfall, arable land, and they were, they were just underutilized. So we, we did some research and we realized that there are a lot of Kenyans who spotted that opportunity and they have taken, they, they have, they have leased, leased yeah. they, are, they have gotten some lease to the, to the huge chunks of farms and they are doing some farming, especially maize, mm-hmm. and then maize is like corn, and then they usually export the maize back to Kenya. So that is very smart of Kenyans, and I think many other countries also have considered that. Yeah. It is a very great business, but Zambia, considering the amount of land they have, I was hoping that food in Zambia would be cheaper, but it's not. It's not. It's not, because the, there's a lot of farm very much underutilized you can see it by the road there are some very positive observations we made in zambia first of all lusaka is a proper city if i was ever to live in lusaka in in zambia lusaka would be one of the places i would live lusaka and livingstone because those are the only the only towns i've been to 
So Lusaka has very modern buildings. There are plenty of shopping malls with a variety of stuff. In fact, my first time trying out Biltong was in Lusaka. Mm -hmm. And I asked so many questions. I asked the one of the attendants plenty of questions about Biltong. And it has many things to do. When you're in Lusaka, just check out our video on on when we were in Lusaka. There are many things to do in Lusaka. When you went down to... Between Lusaka and Livingstone, the road is also very good. So when we got to Livingstone, we also realized that Livingstone is the... It's like the touristic capital of Zambia. Because the hospitality industry there is on point. They have very beautiful hotels. They are, their nightlife is quite vibrant. The people, the attendants here and there, they offer very good customer service. There are plenty of foreigners, yes, because of, of Victoria Falls, but you could spot a lot of local tourists, especially when we are going to, to the boiling pot. To the boiling pot mm -hmm. when we were in Zambia, we came across so many young young people from Zambia who had come to see the the, the Victoria Falls and the rock formations and all that. That, that was really really great we met a very friendly police who was telling us a lot of stories about zambia and the politics in zambia it was just amazing to watch that and considering the the road that we had passed through before we got to lusaka and livingstone we felt like it was there are many many educated people there's it's very civilized in those two two towns. Mm -hmm. The other sides were a bit uncivilized, I would say. Most people live mm -hmm. in towns up country. There are very, very few people. Mm -hmm. And I think that is why their land is very much unutilized. Yes. Yeah. So that was a very, very nice thing to observe. They, are, they, they have also utilized the Mosi Oitunya. Mosi Oitunya is Victoria Falls. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of activities that they offer. There is the, what do you call it? Devil's the Devil's Pool. pool. There is okay the, the Victoria Falls itself when you get in, and then you can go to the boiling pot. The boiling pot. Actually, guys, if you mm -hmm. manage to go to Zambian side of Victoria Falls, ensure you get to to the boiling pot. It's quite a hike, but it's worth it. Yes, there are plenty mm -hmm. of activities that were in Livingstone. I was very much impressed. The steam engine train as well is uh -huh. in. So I think those are very nice things about Zambia that would make me go back to Zambia. Another shocker was about the time difference. Zambia is on the Central African time. Our first time crossing over. Not the first the time. The second time. The second time. We crossed the over in, in, Rwanda. in Rwanda. Yeah. The second time when we we're going to Zambia. Mm -hmm. Now the difference with, with this situation of Zambia is that nightfall comes very early. Mm -hmm. As early as 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. Is it 5 or 6? 6? 6 p.m. Yeah, yeah. 6 p.m. is pitch black. Mm -hmm. And then the sun rises as early as 5, 5 a.m. What a surprise. And the temperatures <laughs> are quite high, as high as 30 degrees at 5 a.m. So oversleeping in Zambia might be tricky if you're, if you're coming from Kenya. You see the way we told you guys that, at UK, that from 4, 4 a.m. you're allowed to drive? Usually it's bright, mm -hmm. so it's not necessarily dangerous. Yes, but it also depends on the with the time when you'll be traveling through Zambia, because remember the length of day and night is controlled by the latitudes where the sun is, the latitude where the sun is, whether it is at the equator or whether it's at the Capricorn or mm -hmm. Cancer. Mm -hmm. We travel during which month? In November. In November. October. 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 Yes. October is, is when we were in Zambia. Yes, that is why we had the time difference. That mm -hmm. the time difference was quite clear. Yes. Now, on to the last point, border processes. As we said in our last video, most of the border processes in all the countries we visited during the circuit was seamless, even, with an exception of one. Mm -hmm. Even in Zambia, the mm -hmm. other borders were very fine. Yeah, the, other fine the, the other borders were fine except Tunduma. Ah, it's, a nightmare. It's been said, even with an agent, a good day, you'd spend six, six hours. hours, at least six hours on the border. We did spend six hours. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're going there, allocate that time, six hours. Or even a day. Or even a full day. <laughs> if if you fall on a bad day, allocate a full day to the mm -hmm. border process, to crossing over to the other side. Warm heart of Africa, yes. Malawi. Malawi. So Malawi people are very kind, very warm people and very generous. 
if you've met any Malawian, you would agree with me that they are very nice people to interact with. Also, they are most of the time they are very hardworking. We saw that they they also have very fertile land and mm -hmm. good weather. So we, we realized that their farms were all tilled, like they were ready for planting. We passed by when it was planting season and they did not have any mechanized form of form of uh, what do you call it? Tilling the land. Tilling the land. They were literally digging with their own hands. You'd see so many people on the ro on the on the farm just digging here and there, putting some like putting some seeds on the farm and all that. We were just so impressed. And that explains why there is a lot of food in in Malawi. Malawi food is quite cheap, I would say. Food is quite cheap, even even they do mostly I think uh, crop growing and mm -hmm. fishing mostly. Mm -hmm. And they t some of the type of fish that they they fish is there is the daga. Daga is called what? Silverfish. I'm told it's not silverfish, but the the the, the tiny fish. They are mm -hmm. very tiny. They are called daga, or omena in Kenya. You call it omena. Mm -hmm. They also fish chambo, fish. It is one of the signature fish that is mainly in from Lake Malawi, chambo mm -hmm. fish, and it's very delicious. If you pass by Malawi, ensure you try out chambo fish. We really loved it. And chicken kwasu kwasu. <laughs> <laughs> very delicious. By the way, they are very good chefs. Mm -hmm. You will hardly get bad food in, in Malawi. Okay, one thing we realized is that I don't think the Malawi, people in Malawi are well empowered about tourism in Malawi because they were surprised why would we drive all the way to Malawi to just go and see Lake Malawi. Yes. They don't see it as a tourist attraction. They just see it as a source of fish. And in fact, they even don't fish throughout the year. Yeah, it's actually seasonal. They, they fish seasonally. Because when you are there, we, even, even the fish markets were closed. Mm -hmm. There were very few people who are airing their, 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 their who are dry, drying their, their daga. So that, that is something that maybe the government needs to improve on. Mm -hmm. uh, what else about the people? On the fishing, that was surprising to us because we utilize like Victoria to the fullest all year round, all year round, especially the Kenyan uh -huh. side where anywhere around, especially the, the Kisumu side. Yes. Once you just get close to the lake, you'll feel the, the, the fish, fish smell. smell. We never saw that, we never felt that in, in it. yes, like Malawi was really clean, Very no clean. signs of fish smell. Anywhere. There's no fishy smell anywhere, so it's either they underutilize the lake or they're just clean people. Maybe they're just clean people, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, but they don't see the lake, the lake as a source of, other than fishing, they don't think that the lake is another source of income. Mm -hmm. So lo local tourism is still low. Yeah. We noticed. Yeah. Also about food, there are a lot of mangoes, and not just mangoes, sweet mangoes in Malawi. In fact, you could just, when, whenever we, just next to the highway, there were so many mango trees with mangoes just falling off and nobody picking them up like sure. It's a land of plenty also. Yes. Because in Kenya mm. you would have to pay a lot of money for, for those mangoes. Right now mangoes in Kenya is like almost a tiny one. It's 20 shillings or 30 or, shillings. Or even 40 shillings. And remember when you bought a bucket full of mangoes in Malawi, we paid an equivalent of almost 150 shillings. It was 50 Kenya shillings. It was 50 Kenya shillings. 50 Kenya shillings yeah. yeah, it was quite cheap. I just wish that the government in Malawi would empower its people by constructing maybe a manufacturing company where they can make juice or yes. mango pulp for mm -hmm. export or for local use. Now let's talk about Malawian infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They have relatively poor roads. However, there are active construction going on, especially in Lilongwa. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the next two, three years, you'd expect to see good roads. Piece of advice, don't drive at night in Malawi. Yes, the roads are a bit narrow and poor. Most of the bridges we encountered were one lane bridges so you'd have to wait on this other side for the other car to pass so that you can go through it which is a bit dangerous especially if you're driving at night so again avoid driving at night if you're not familiar with the roads yeah their cities are relatively small 
especially Lilongwe. We actually drove around for a long time looking for the central business district. And then we noticed we had we passed it. Didn't it. <laughs> but we had passed Like the entire time we were in the central business <laughs> district. But we were told so, Blanta however, is bigger. Yeah, we were told Blanta is bigger. Mzuzu was actually bigger yeah. as well. Yeah. So, even though we passed Mzuzu at night, mm-hmm. but we felt like it was bigger. It was bigger. Mm-hmm. That aside, Lilongo is really beautiful. It's a green city. Yeah. Like how we say Nairobi is a green city. This is the greenest city under the sun. You've not seen Lilongo. Lilongo is green. It's less congested, less crowded. Very fresh. Very so, few few commotions with border borders. Yes. Yeah, so if you are actually looking to live in Malawi, you should consider Lilongo. Mm-hmm. What else? Let's talk about technologies. Mm-hmm. As we mentioned earlier, they have the cheapest after Kenya for, for the countries we've gone to after Kenya Malawi has the cheapest fastest internet yes offered by Airtel it was really reliable, reliable. You could not even believe you were shocked it's <laughs> cheap reliable internet mm-hmm. when you go there don't expect to use card payments everywhere even in major cities you will not be able to swipe in petrol stations to get fuel yeah so i would advise you to carry cash carry cash carry cash Otherwise, you hey, you will be stranded. You will get stranded in Malawi. Being a, a small country, economically they are they are below all the other Southern African countries. They have very few cars, and with that in mind, public service vehicles are also few. But the few that you will see, they are so overloaded. I think they prefer the Sienta Toyota Sienta. Yes. You know, you okay. If you're a Kenyan, you know how the how the how we usually utilize our Probox. Pro Box. Now that is the same same way that the Pro Box and in in the in the southern countries, south southern African countries, it's Bucky. the Bucky's. Mm-hmm. Yes, the pickups. How they usually utilize the overutilize the the Bucky's. Now that is how this Toyota Sienta is utilized in Malawi. You like Toyota Sienta can can carry up to how many people? Four, five at most. Five people. But from that one car, you'll see like 12 people coming from that car. And the baggage, oh my God. The baggage, the luggages are just too much. They're too much. You literally see the boot. It's like the boot of the car is just crawling on the floor. Mm -hmm. Literally on the floor. We could not believe it. And with those horrible roads, somehow they could overspeed on those roads while our car was still struggling struggling on the road. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> so the public service means of transport is also something else. I think if you want to travel across that country using public service, you might want to get maybe a bus from either Tanzania or mm-hmm. maybe Zambia. Yes. Otherwise, if you want to use the local means, you will suffer. You'll get squeezed in there with 12 other people. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, having said that, Mm, the accommodation, okay, I keep referring to the notes, we brought down some notes. Mm-hmm. The accommodation is very cheap. Imagine the room that we stayed, it's KK. Yes, KK Highway at Nkota Kota. Nkota Kota. Yes. We stayed somewhere in some some lodge called KK. We paid almost a thousand Kenyan shillings per room, right? Yes. Per room, and each room had air conditioning, hot water, Heavy breakfast, huge bed, huge and comfortable bed, and an entire mm-hmm. compound to yourself. You, you just park there, you can do everything you want there. Imagine, for a thousand Kenyan shillings, you can convert that in whichever currency you you understand. Imagine, guys, that never happens in Kenya. It will be impossible. Impossible. Maybe 10 years back, you would get that. Not, the entire not, no. trip that we, Malawi had the cheapest cheapest accommodation we were mm-hmm. just surprised after we had overspent hey Cape Town hey Cape Town <laughs> Cape Town you did a number on us especially our pocket <laughs> yes. but it was very very enjoyable staying in Cape Town but you understand that you get the point so that is Malawi I would really I would go back there anytime it's a very beautiful country beautiful terrain beautiful people in fact we had been invited by some resort to go back there yes and we will we'll, we'll be, be back. back 
I know you guys say that we never went to Zimbabwe, but truth be told, we went to Zimbabwe. Remember when we were visiting Victoria Falls, we went to the Zambian side and the Zimbabwe side. Now, there's something that really impressed me about Zimbabwe. The view of Victoria Falls from the Zimbabwe side is very beautiful. We loved that bridge. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, the view on the, on the bridge is spectacular. You'll see the rock formation and all that. That is just an observation. Now, the culture shock that we found in Zimbabwe. Every time we came across like the locals, even the taxi drivers, we would ask them for Zimbabwe, Zimb Zimbabwean dollars. We usually travel and we are collectors of currencies. So we are hoping to get maybe a note or two of the Zimbabwean dollars and we could not find it. Imagine even the, the taxi driver who carried us from the Zimbabwe side towards Zambia, the Zambia border, he told us that he can't remember the last time he used the Zimbabwean board dollar. Yeah. They just used the US dollars. Mm -hmm. That was surprising. I didn't expect it was... The inflation was that bad. I didn't expect the inflation was that bad. Also, something that impressed me was the restaurants and the area around Victoria Falls in the Zimbabwe side. It's very modern and very beautiful restaurants. Oh, I remember the gelatos. Yes. Oh, hey, my God. Yeah. Very, which is which was our favorite? The blueberry, was it blueberry or mixed berry? I just remember you took a horrible one. Was it chocolate? I, I took salted caramel. I didn't, <laughs> was, that is just the, I didn't like the salted caramel, but the, the blueberry one was it nice, it was perfect. Was just I kept scooping the ice cream. <laughs> and remember, when you go to Zimbabwe side, just carry dollars, they transact in dollars, it will make your work very easy. Because they say that if you have to to transact with Zimbabwean dollars, it means you'll carry plenty of money. But now, good news. Good news is that Zimbabwe has introduced new currency. It's called Zimbabwean gold. Mm -hmm. And it's much stronger with less zeros at the end. In fact, the biggest note is 200. 200, 200 uh, Zimbabwean gold. They call it Zig. Zig. Yes. Uh, now, as as at today, when we are recording this video, they have been given like three weeks, three weeks to ensure they clear the Zimbabwean dollars and they take it back to their banks, central bank, so that they can get the Zig Zimbabwean gold. It is quite strong. What is the exchange rate? Thirteen Zimbabwean gold is equal to one dollar. One dollar. One, one, one USD. USD. But in Africa, it will be one of the strongest currency mm. in the in the in Africa. I don't know how they did that. The people who do finance, I think it's the same thing that Zim Zambia also did. Mm -hmm. They reduced the zeros in their money. I don't know if that really makes a currency stronger or. But I don't think it's, it affects it. It and it really it really affects the economy. There's no change in economy, right? It's just the currency. It should. I don't know. If you've done finance, please advise us on that. We are not. We are blonde in this. Yes, in that area we are a bit green, so that is good news for us. Yeah, and that's it for Zimbabwe. We didn't. We were there literally for a minute, so we do not have many culture shocks about the country. We will plan to visit there. Mm -hmm. Some and other the times, rocks. the rocks. We were, lit then... we were there literally six hours. Yes. Oh, one more thing. Crossing over from Zambia to Zimbabwe is very smooth. Very smooth at the border. You you just tell them, I'm going to see Victoria Falls, and they just, at the immigration, they just stamp your, 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 your passport. passport. It's very smooth. So do not fear. If you have an option of going to Zimbabwe to watch, to see Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, just go. It's very smooth. You'll take less than an hour at the border, and unless you get to a very long queue. Otherwise, it's just very fast. Mm -hmm. And you go to Zimbabwe, and then you return. 